explain a couple ground rules here. Generally, we've got 61 people on the call so far, 62. Uh, do stay muted unless you're gonna ask a question. You can also text a question in. Questions are very welcome anytime by text. Verbally, we're gonna take some breaks. So Alan's gonna talk about, I think six different sites of his favorite sites of birding around North Queensland, it may just be four, but I think it's six. But after we do one geographic area, I'm gonna slow him down and we're gonna stop for two or three questions. And that format usually goes pretty good. Um, and if you've got an urge to pour in a question, text it over, Leo will share it. And otherwise you can unmute when we open for questions, just kind of one person at a time, please. Um, okay, so that's the introduction. Questions are welcome. Um, a little bit on my friend, Alan Galea Anders. Um, he's been a bird guide and natural history guide in North Queensland area of Australia for over 25 years. Um, he's mostly earned his living as a school teacher, um, but he's led birding, wildlife, botanical, geological, and all sorts of natural history tours for various local, interstate, international interest groups, um, including bird watching companies, which what we love him for. Um, besides guiding, he's worked as a national park volunteer and is active in local conservation organizations in kind of a cool way. He has worked for many of the well-known international and national documentary film makers as a consulting naturalist and TV shows. And um, that's just kind of hip, man. Um, Alan's years of experience and expertise will shine through today and on any of our North Queensland tours. Alan loves to keep learning about this air area and he, he loves to share his knowledge about birds, wildlife, and natural history. Um, with no further ado, Alan Galanders, go my friend. Well, good afternoon over there. It's good morning here. Um, I was just telling Charles early and a few other people earlier on, it's uh, 21 degrees here. We're at uh, 750 meters, so about 2,200 feet above sea level uh, in a tropical paradise. And uh, we get to live, um, I, I, I get to, <laughs> my wife's just going out to our tree planting group. Um, we Tomorrow we're going to be planting about 3,000 trees, I think it is, rainforest trees, the, the extending a corridor along a, um, a river near where Maria used to farm. Uh, right, back to the birding. Uh, so how do we go to the, to the screen? Just move to the next slide. Just press your right oh, button. It should take you there. Right, so you're sharing yeah. that now? Yes, we got it. Right. Right. Uh, so Lake Berean is one of my favorite birding places. We don't often see platypus there, but they are there. Um, this is for one of my ex-guests who's uh, who remembers seeing platypus just below my house. Lake Berean is a volcanic mar, a little bit higher than here. It's about uh, 68 meters deep surrounded by rainforest, except for this little area of private land that has a garden and a lovely tea house and restaurant. But let's get into some birds. This is an area where we can see uh, Victoria's rifle bird, our local bird of paradise. In the tropics, uh, there are a lot of single parents in the birding world because they can. 
but uh, that puts the pressure on the males mostly to be outstanding. Uh, and uh, so he's dancing to convince this girl that uh, he's the one. One of the bowerbirds that occasionally visits my garden is the spotted catbird, but he's not a promiscuous bowerbird, so he doesn't have to build a bower or other kind of structure. They do dance. Um, it's a bonding technique, I think works for us. So um, why not for the, for the birds as well? Uh, they not related to the catbirds of the Americas. These are a bowerbird. Our smallest parrot in Australia is the double-eyed fig parrot. There's the male in the centre and the female tucked up to the top left side. You can see that these little parrots, those, those figs are half an inch in diameter. These little parrots could be quite easily overlooked uh, despite their lovely colours. While on parrots, we have uh, three species of lorikeet around here. This is the scaly breasted lorikeet. Can't see why they'd call it that. Um, they uh, often fly in flocks and uh, sometimes the, the juniors in the flocks with uh, rainbow lorikeets as well. On the forest floor is the very pugnacious yellow-throated scrub wren. These guys, uh, particularly the males like this one, will jump out and tell you off uh, for all of a second and a half. They're very brave and then they'll disappear into the forest. Bird I mentioned earlier being one of my favourites, the yellow-breasted boat bird. Tiny little bird, often in the uh, mid canopy. So it uh, seeing them Below eye height is uh, not a common occurrence, but uh, a stunning little bird. The uh, people worry about uh, moving through the rainforest, uh, leeches, mosquitoes, ticks. We have very little problem uh, with them. Uh, the Lyme's disease is very rare in Australia. Uh, leeches don't carry any nasty diseases and um, while our house is screened uh, we don't get many mosquitoes we can have a barbecue outside quite comfortably all right so that uh, that's the first location Lake Breen uh, yeah so just um, I'll open with a few questions then we'll invite in a few more you have a mere 77 participants today. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Charles, looks so, like nobody wants to come to Australia. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> um, so Bur Lake Boreen, we typically spend two to four hours birding there or a full day? Uh, That's we a half day a thing, right? Yeah, half day, a little less. Um, there's uh, a 600 metre trail with, yeah. along which uh, we'll get um, toothbill bowbird if it's the right time of year. Uh, otherwise, we may well get them in the garden, either eating fruit or in the winter when there's not much fruit around, they eat leaves, one of the few birds that eat leaves. And um, like in the three to four hours were there. Typically, how many species, different bird species did you get at Lake Boreen itself? Ooh, um, maybe 40, something like that. Uh, quite a few honey eaters. Uh, the, in, the, in the gardens at the tea house, the, a lot of uh, nectar rich plants. And so you got a lot of honey eaters there. Um, you know, sometimes you can be really lucky and rock up in the car park and uh, the birds you're after are just hanging around the edge of the car park. As, as birding goes, 
Well, um, it does. I mean, sometimes you go off looking in the forest and you come back in the bird you're after sitting above your car. We did one question about double-eyed parakeet. Do you have any yes. idea why it's called double-eyed? Uh, no, I don't. And, and <laughs> if you if you were to look up the scientific name, it's uh, Cyclopsida diophthalma. So Cyclops, the one-eyed parrot. Well, you could understand that with that red dot on the forehead, like a, uh, an Indian uh, mark there. Um, the the one-eyed, two-eyed parrot. I, no, I've got no idea. It's a, it's a silly name, but if you're a taxonomist, you've got to do something for fun. Yeah. So no good answer there. Um, uh, not from me anyway. And feel free to unmute if you have a question or text it over. All righty. I, I have a quick question for yeah, Alan. This is Dave. Um, so you started us in Lake Berean. Where would people go to to begin the tour? Where would they fly into? Uh, they would fly into Cairns. Um, Cairns is uh, in North Queensland. If you look at on a map of Australia, it's the bottom of the pointy bit that goes up towards New Guinea on the east coast. So it gives access to uh, the coastal strip, which is uh, largely developed uh, cane farming mostly and uh, housing, but gives access to the Barrier Reef and up here onto the tablelands and beyond out into the semi-arid zone. Yeah, and, and, and besides some of the little special sites we're gonna do today, um, I suspect we'll spend a little bit of time on tablelands, which is the big, the big premiere there. And then- yeah, it's uh, the, the tablelands is the premier area because this is where the endemics uh, are but there's some really good areas on the coast as well. Yeah. So um, also for a, the typical itinerary we do in the area, do check out our website, www.pibird.com. You can sort of navigate to Oceania, then Australia, and then you can pick the North Queensland plan. Um, I think we should move to the next area. And again, feel free to text questions. And if you're uh, unmuted, please mute again because we've got 80 people on the call now. Wow, wonderful. Yeah, no. uh, Mount Hypipami, now this is at a thousand meters and uh, it's one of my favorite parts of uh, North Queensland because it has incredible possum diversity as uh, well as uh, some very special birds. The, that, by the way, is a Herbert River ringtail possum. Our possums are not very closely related to your opossums. Uh, they're marsupials, uh, but that's about it. I mean, you're a eutherian and so is an elephant, and you're probably not that closely related to an elephant. But uh, birds we can see in the car park include the uh, Wampu fruit dove, a bit bigger than a domestic pigeon, but not much, and uh, rather colourful. Grey-headed robins are often hopping around on the lawn there, um, though there have been times I've gone there and failed to find them, but uh, the, lo the lovely little robin, um, not a true robin, of course. Um, they used to be lumped in with thickheads, uh, but they're, they're now off in their, the Australian fly robins group. But the special bird of that area is the golden bowerbird. He's the smallest of all the bowerbirds, has the smallest population of all the bowerbirds, including New Guinea, where they get uh, hunted for their feathers. And in, he doesn't build a tunnel type bower that you might have seen on the David Attenborough programs. He builds a maypole bower, uh, one, two or four 
maypoles of sticks. And this is the fruit that he decorates the bower with. He also uses lichen. He, in the dark of the forest, he, he looks uh, dull brown on the back, but uh, if you get him in the sun, that goes a burnished greeny sort of color. He decorates the bower. He doesn't spend a lot of time in the bower. So they're a bird that you need, really need to know the bird or be very lucky to find because they'll spend a lot of time sitting around just in sight of their bower. They don't call, they don't respond to playback. Um, and this is a species that I built my reputation around because uh, people couldn't find them. Uh, they're, not, they're not really rare, they're just restricted. They were moving up the hills and we were wondering what was happening there as the population seemed to be declining. But last year, some of the uh, lower uh, historic sites are being repopulated again. So uh, nature's pretty crazy. Not, not an endemic to Australia, but the blue-faced parrot finch is a, a difficult bird to find. And uh, in winter, particularly so, I suspect they spend a lot of time in the canopy eating insects. But um, uh, in the spring and, and the summer, which is now, they're eating grass seeds and uh, breeding. I've never managed to find a nest. I found newly fledged uh, young ones, but they're a very special uh, finch. They're medium sized finch. The monarch flycatchers are a lovely group, and this is the my uh, the cap strap joining to the, the, the chest band. Uh, they, they both build a nest which they decorate with lichens and uh, very beautiful uh, nests. All the monarch flycatchers have lovely nests. And one of our very iconic birds, the southern cassowary, can sometimes be seen at Mount Hopipimi. These um, birds have a bad reputation. They're actually, if you're in the forest, away from where people interfere with them, they're one of the most uh, chilled out megafauna you'll find anywhere. They, they, they feel secure, they're curious, but they don't really give much of a damn about what you're up to. They, they just want to have a look and then go about their way. Unfortunately, people will sometimes feed them and then that brings them out onto roads because they associate roads with people. And uh, in an incident with a vehicle, uh, the, ca the car doesn't always win, but the cassowary always loses. And I think that's the last one for this site. Yep. So we're doing pretty good on time. Um, anybody got any questions out there? We may get zipping along if we have none. Um, I'm usually full of questions, just not at the moment. You're doing a beautiful job. I love the presentation so far, by the way, sir. What month would you have yeah. a little cassowary like that? Uh, the, the cassowary, uh, the young chicks like this, are possible between uh, August and January. So quite a long period of time. The, the cassowaries are promiscuous. The females have the bigger range. The males uh, don't breed every 12 months. So what tends to happen is if they be, if they, um, if she managed to seduce him and lay him a uh, bunch of eggs and the chicks hatch in, uh, July or August one year, then 
the, it's likely to be September or September, October the next year. And then uh, around Christmas, New Year, the next year. And then he's probably going to have a year off because this is a male cassowary. The males uh, incubate the eggs. That's how you can sex them actually, because not that you have to go around seeing if they've got eggs. Um, the brood patch is behind the, uh, the legs. So males have bigger bottoms and uh, droopier ones, whereas the female, female, females tend to be cut off. And uh, so when you're in, in the forest and you sing, see a single cassowary uh, with a little experience, if there's more bird behind the hips, then it's a male. If there's more bird in front of the hips, it's a female. Right. So that's uh, uh, the time of year that we can see chicks. I did have a, f a film producer a uh, year before last, say, we want to find uh, a wild cassowary male on eggs. Uh, I said, you realise that that's uh, only been photographed twice in history. Um, uh, yeah, I can give it a go. Um, but they decided that uh, the expense and the, the risks um, didn't make it viable for them. Yeah. Hey, um, got two questions about the little blue spherical berry looking like things that it looks like the cassowary is about to stick in its mouth in the photo. Right. So that's a, a blue quandong. If you're talking about the fruit, that's yeah. quandong. Um, the, uh, or silver quandong, if you're talking about the timber, it's a fast growing uh, rainforest tree as long as you protect the roots from grass competition and um, the the adult uh, cassowary would not be uh, giving that to the to that chick uh, unless he found a smaller one but it's amazing how uh, how big something uh, can be that the cassowaries swallow. They, they're they good at spreading large fruited tree species and they'll spread them quite some distance as well. Great. Um, and you had a second well, question there, Chuck. No, the, it was two questions about the blue sphere, blueberry fruit, which I think we covered right. very effectively. Any um, I think we'll move on. There's we'll, another oh, question, Charles. I do have one thing that I forgot. Um, somewhere along the way, are we going to see a bowerbird nest? Uh, not a nest, but I've got a bow for you. Well, that's what I mean. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, a no, 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 no. No, I'm, a... I'm learning. You're learning. It's all good. I'm going to get off the call and I'm going to let you move on. Right. -o. Slipping down to the coast, we go to the Daintree River. This is a uh, beautiful stream. Uh, that there's a small area of it that has um, human impacts, but most of the uh, most of the river, which rises almost directly over that left-hand tree. Uh, goes north for 40 kilometres, south for 40 kilometres, and then uh, takes another 15 kilometres, wandering its way out to sea from here. This is actually taken uh, from a small boat just at the Daintree village itself. Lovely spot for either an early morning or late afternoon cruise to go bird watching. Oh, you may see a couple of crocodiles. One of the iconic birds of the Daintree River is the great billed heron. This uh, bird is also special to me. Uh, it's totemic for me. Um, I don't know it was mentioned since we started the group, the whole group, um, 
but I was fortunate enough to grow up in a couple of Aboriginal communities. This uh, bird is a skulker, but can be uh, seen fairly regularly on the Daintree River. Uh -huh. Though you don't often get them flying towards you like this. The area is noted for its kingfishers. Australia has only two kingfishers that are obligate fishes. That's this one, the azure kingfisher and the little kingfisher. Most of our kingfishers are forest kingfishers like the two kookaburras that we have and the forest kingfisher, uh, obviously. Perhaps on frogmouth is the largest of the frogmouths. Uh, does everybody see the, um, the second bird, the chick? Um, uh, please tucked mute in if you're not in the branch. Too, by the by. Right, so uh, the Daintree River is one of the easiest places uh, to find the Papuan frogmouth. Our female black neck stork, you can tell the female because she has the evil looking yellow eyes uh, and she's looking down her bill at us as we've uh, gone past uh, quite slowly with the uh, electric motor on and uh, she uses that huge bill to uh, hunt for fish, frogs and reptiles. I've seen them take small crocs and uh, crabs. The mast lapwing is a common grass bird, uh, grassland bird in Australia. This is the northern race which has a bigger mask and a smaller spur. If you look at uh, the front of a chest there you can just see the right hand spur sticking out. Uh, the in southern Australia, that black cap comes down around the bend of the wing, and they're quite likely to uh, give you a, uh, a clip on the head if you go near the eggs. But us North Queenslanders, we're a little bit demure, more demure than that, and so are our birds. Ooh. And uh, if you've got an Australian book, this this bird might be called a yellow oriole. It's a, a crazy name because there's so many yellow orioles around the world and this one's not very yellow. Um, for you Americans have got it right and call it the green oriole. So I agree with you on that. So that uh, does us for the Daintree. Yeah, a couple more good questions. Um, and um, just on all of our video conferences, we get a lot of people jump on who've guided with the guide before. So a couple more nice comments coming in from people about what a great guide you are. Don't blush. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, thanks for those. I'll be comments. careful about that. I may have paid them to say those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, an interesting question, um, just in general, what was the impact of the wildfires from last year on avian populations? Of course, in your neck of the wood, it may be different. Right, in our neck of the woods, um, they, they didn't really happen. Uh, summer in North, Northern Australia is when it's wet, uh, so, we don't tend to get those catastrophic uh, fires that put houses and uh, lives at risk. In, in Southern Australia, where the eucalypts actually produce uh, more uh, eucalyptus oils and other oils, the, the, the fires were catastrophic. There and they have impacted on bird populations. The, 
it's part of the process of just nibbling away at the edges though this was a fair bite that uh, that pushes wildlife not just the AV fauna into smaller and smaller patches of habitat and smaller and disjunct populations it, they were very disturbing for their impacts um, uh, fortunately for birds, they have wings and um, they'll use them. And uh, some areas of uh, the bird life crashed, but is coming back. Uh, some of the uh, more restricted species, not so much. But up here, uh, we haven't had that problem. I mean, I'm not suggesting wildfires isn't a problem. Uh, in North Queensland, uh, fire management is uh, not rocket science. It's nowhere near that simple. Uh, there are a lot of issues. The Australian landscape needs fire. The question is how hot, when, how often, uh, and sometimes the protection of property um, takes priority and that's not always the best interest of the environment. Alrighty. Um, another, I think, good question with a quick answer. Um, and I'll make it a two part order. About how tall is the Southern Cassaway area? Sorry, how common is the Southern Cassowary? How tall? How tall? Is it Sorry. Um, how, Charles, how, not... tall? how tall? How calm are the Southern Cassowaries? The, in, uh, in a wild area, a wild bird, as I said before, is one of the most chilled out animals you could ever come across. Uh, however, we're where people uh, interfere with the birds, usually by feeding them, uh, they can become demanding. Uh, give you an example. There was a there's a bird at Mount Hypipami, a female who has had to be hazed a couple of times by the rangers. They've um, let off firecrackers yeah. and uh, made big noises and chased her away because she was creating problems in the car park but one of the places that I like to go is right on one of her daily routes and if I was there in the forest and she came towards me she would come uh, if I was sitting down uh, she would come as close as three meters however if I stood up she'd back off to five or seven meters. If I was walking towards her, she seven to 10 meters was as close as she felt comfortable. But she would, uh, after walking five or six meters in front of me, she would then move off to the side if and just let me go past. Okay, hey, I think we missed the question. Oh. Um, and maybe it's my uh, use of the English language versus yours. But um, how tall? What is the height of the typical? Oh, how tall? Community? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, uh, they're, they're normally, they're, their back is, is about a human hip height. So yeah. when, uh, when an adult cassowary stands up, it can look most humans in the face. So it's a big bird. The, a big female from the coast can weigh uh, 65 kilograms. So multiply that by 2.2, whoever's good at arithmetic, and um, that's it in pounds. 230 pounds. Whoa, baby. Yeah. It's a big beat. It's a um, big animal. Yeah, I think we should go on to the next bit. Back 
Back on the tablelands again, but on the northern area in the drier country, Granite Gorge is a uh, private conservation park and camping grounds. And there they have some habituated rock wallabies. Uh, these are uh, quite a small wallaby. They could uh, sit in your lap. In fact, they sometimes will. These uh, particular animals are, are habituated and want to be fed. And here, Chuck, is your bowbird. This is a great bowbird. We're looking down the tunnel at him. He's uh, practicing showing off special treasures to the female. The female will sit about halfway between the, our, uh, our viewing point and the bird in the, that tunnel. The tunnel has the effect of uh, focusing and restricting her view. So he will play coy, uh, just like in our species, coyness isn't shyness, it's a, hey, look at me strategy. And uh, he will go off to the side and then come back, uh, show her some of the special treasures, flash the pink, uh, on the nape of the neck, which is uh, really hot pink, can be um, uh, the feathers can be hidden away, those pink feathers, but he can also open them out and they make a disc over an inch across. And then he'll dance and squawk along the outside of the bower to uh, make her turn around in there and that's that's a bit of a struggle. And he goes off uh, trying to impress her. She mean, meantime will go and visit a few other males to do a um, bit of window shopping and uh, eventually decide on the male that's got the most impressive bower collection of treasures and is the best dancer. And they'll mate in the bower which leads me back to the golden bowbird. Uh, mating in that species does not occur at the bow. In fact, it's never been witnessed or at least never been witnessed by anybody who's been prepared to record it and publish it. Whereas all the other bowbirds that build any kind of structure, whether it's a, uh, a, a maypole, a avenue like this or the teepee like the Vogelkopf bowbird in uh, West Papua uh, mate in or at the bow. Very special birds. These uh, double barred finches are in the avicultural trade in your country. I think the uh, people that keep them in cages call them owl finches and I guess you could see why. Another little bird of the grass uh, areas uh, is the red-backed fairy wren. This is the male, the females and young birds, uh, uh, the color of his uh, primaries and secondaries there. Uh, they have, uh, they breed cooperatively. It's a pair with the young males that didn't grow well enough to colour up in their first year, uh, stay behind to raise their siblings. We could uh, spend some quite, quite some time looking at the family structure and um, uh, the sexual behaviour of these little birds. They're fascinating. And everyone that comes to Australia wants to see a kookaburra. This is the blue wing kookaburra with a crazy uh, white eye and the um, streaks in the forehead. Uh, often they sit up a little bit and he looks like he's got a mohawk uh, haircut. I think, oh no, rainbow lorikeet, a ubiquitous bird in, a, in Australia. But uh, I need to remind myself that just because I see these birds every day doesn't uh, mean they're not special for someone who seeing them for the first time. 
And that's Granite Gorge. All right. Anybody got any questions? Feel free to unmute, ask your question. Mute again. Text it in. Any questions out there? Dave is the last name I want. Of course I Go, my friend. This is a Bowerbird question, Alan. All right. Um, I had the good fortune to see the satin Bowerbird at Lamington. Yes. And it collects blue objects because yes. it's blue. The Bowerbird that you just showed us, is it known for collecting, like it had all those shells. Does it only want those pale colored shells or does it collect other things? Right, so this this is the um, great bowerbird, and it predominantly collects gray and white things. It also collects uh, green and red. But if you, if you think of things that are green and red in nature, they tend not to last very long. So if you're well away from human habitation, it'll just be shells, stones, uh, skulls, bits of bone. But if you're near humans, where there's always some detritus, they they love glass beads, uh, green glass beads that people use in uh, uh, floral arrangements because they last. Um, one of the birds that I often visit is in a friend's yard and uh, she has to plant uh, three times as many chili plants as uh, you would normally plant in the garden for a couple because the bowerbird keeps collecting the green chilies but they love hot pink plastics and uh, red plastics and uh, it's quite likely that uh, a bowerbird that I'd show you would have um, uh, pink plastics in it as well. Great question, Dave. Dave is on a many calls and always asks outstanding questions. All questions are welcome. Any other good questions out there, feel free to unmute and ask away or text away. Kieran Nunn, I think next is the Great Barrier Reef. Is that what I saw? <laughs> All right, so if you're going to travel all this way, you might as well go out to the reef. So birding the Great Barrier Reef. That's uh, Ocean Spirit uh, vessel there. And it's at Michaelmas Cay, which is a bird, bird breeding rookery. And you can get fairly close to the birds. There's... Uh, most of the K is uh, restricted. It's a no-go zone area, but there's a beach for you to land and to snorkel off, or you can snorkel off the back of the vessel. On the, there are a variety of seabirds, different terns and noddies that breed there, uh, brown boobies. We always have to check out the brown boobies in case there's any brown form of the red-footed booby. Um, once to my shame, I, uh, we were, we'd left the K and I was looking at some uh, pictures of uh, that one of my guests had taken and I spotted a red-footed booby in the picture and uh, an immature. And uh, we, I was then faced with the moral dilemma. Do I tell everybody there was a red-footed booby there? Um, but I thought, well, most of them had cameras. And so they may well have pictures of the red-footed booby. The, um, the, the closer adult bird is the male. He's pretty much lost his uh, uh, blue breeding flush at this stage because the chick is quite well advanced. <coughs> It's not far from the mainland, but as you can see in the background, but uh, it does take almost two hours to get out there. We do see occasionally some of the pelagic birds on the way, particularly as we slow down to go through a pass in, the, in one of the in 
shore reefs. But there's a, a mixture there of noddies, greater crested terns breeding, but uh, get quite a suite of terns. And it's best to go there on when it's high tide in the middle of the day. So we can take the tender and go round the other side where the uh, small terns are likely to be roosting. And that's a lesser crested tern bringing home the bacon for its chick. Over to you, Charles, or the, anyone with questions. And, and, and I have a couple of questions. Um, I mean, obviously we focus on the birds at the Great Barrier Reef. This boat we use, it, it's a glass bottom boat, right? Well, there, there's, uh, there, they have glass bottom boats out there that yeah. um, we can go to um, that, that we'll use. We, gotcha. So we, we motor out with a, uh, a bigger vessel yeah. and then we decamp either into the water or the glass bottom boat or, or even a submersible. Uh, semi-submersible it's not really it's just a, a deep hold structure that you can sit in and, and then obviously i mean how much other wildlife must you see in a typical great barrier reef tour it must be 60 hundred other fish and other wildlife oh there, there, are, there are hundreds of species of fish and coral and we like the, you're very likely to see green sea turtles, occasionally other species um, uh, such as the hawksbill. Um, when we don't go to areas where we're going to get dugong, which are like your manatee yeah. with, but with um, um, uh, a fork type tail. Uh, the, it's not a huge, birding day but it's a, a very pleasant day out on out on the water and uh, sometimes we get something really exciting like yeah. one of the tropical petrels or exactly um so so you think beyond the birds probably 150 200 to see other species of wildlife the, the, the other things sorry when when you lean back, I have trouble hearing you, Charles. Oh, sorry, um, I'm in a plastic chair in the cabin. Right, um, I apologize. Um, anyway, um, so beyond the birds, probably 150, 200 other species zipping around in the oh. Great Barrier Reef in a typical tour. Yeah, easily. Okay. If you if you can ID the fish, you you'd easily get two hundred fish. Um, yeah, okay. But you, you get um, so, uh, so it's half, a dozen, half a dozen diverse. different. And, sorry, say again. So, so it's just an incredibly diverse ecosystem. Oh, it is. Um, the we've got three um, very diverse ecosystems side by side. Uh, in this part of the world. You've got the barrier reef, the mangroves, and the rainforest. And then the rainforests are not all the same either because you've got different soil types, different altitudes, different aspects, and those all affect the amount of rain the, the, the area gets, the uh, temperatures at which the plants are growing, um, whether they, whether it gets a dry season or not, whether it's wet all year, and um, whether it gets cold uh, as it can up in the uh, high altitudes. And, and in those high altitudes too, you get cloud forests. So you get a, and then you add the savannas and the semi-arid zone that we edge on to. You've got a huge range of habitat, which lends itself to that huge variety of uh, plants and animals. Um, 
I got a couple more questions. I'm going to do one administrative thing, and then we'll try to get to some more questions here. Geographically, are you at the end, my friend? Yes, that's it. Good. So I just I need to do one administrative thing. I, I generally avoid using people's first and last names. I think I've been successful. If for some reason, I mention your first and last name and you feel like you could be identified from the call and you don't want us, and we can erase that from our YouTube presentation, just uh, let us know and we'll uh, take your name out. But um, email service at pibird.com to protect your privacy should we have leaked across it. Um, as you can tell, I'm not a lawyer, but I think we all got a gist of that. Um, so that's that. Um, the usual quantitative question from birders in this, this tour is designed eight days, seven nights. Somebody asked, does it include the Great Barrier Reef? You betcha, it does. Uh, the next question, which we expected, um, about how many bird species do you get in the Evan Dates eight days, seven night tour that we designed? Guesstimate, my I, friend. I would say work on about 320. You might get a few less, a few more. So say 300 to 350 species if you're really lucky. Yeah. That's, that's damn good, bud. Remind me to bird in your direction. It truly <laughs> would come for just the, uh, oh my Lord. What's, what's the little one with the yellow and the black stripes that you love? Uh, the uh, boat bill. Yeah, the boat bill. Good God. I, I'm a little bird. I love little, it'll be beautiful birds. Um, I would come from the boat bill alone. That's the truth. Um, and let me see what else do we got here? Um, there's the boat bill. Yeah, any name you texted, we, you're not on there. Don't worry about that. Um, so uh, there's a question about, hey, did you take all these pictures? Uh, no, I took none of these pictures. Ah. I, I do not take a camera with me when I take a tour. Yeah. Um, perhaps... Perhaps yeah. uh, if they're just guiding one person or a couple and there's something special, uh, like something really special likely to be happening, I might ask to um, take a camera. But these, uh, probably about half of these pictures were given to me by guests and about half were given to me by friends. Yeah, so... There's a couple of questions here. I'm going to handle the logistic -y ones. Um, somebody asked if there's extensions to these tours. One, we can organize North Queensland extensions. However, um, all of our Australian tours are designed to cover four parts of Australia, kind of back to back to back to back. So typically we go Southeast Queensland for a week plus, maybe eight days, seven nights. The North Queensland for eight days, seven nights. This is the tour we just discussed. And then typically we go to Tasmania and the Northern Territories after we do those first two parts. Um, but if you really want an extension in the North Queensland area, we could work that out, but truly most people just book, I mean, most people book three tour modules or four right off the bat. And we've been sort of stunned by how long people want to spend in Australia. But again, typically if you do all four modules, that's a, about a 25, 27 day tour. But again, you can sort of pick and choose. And we'll put you with other bird watchers with similar interests. Um, and then somebody asked, what time of year are these tours? 
we typically schedule them September, October, November. Um, we have a plot to do one in May. Not sure about that. Um, and then some specific bird and mammal questions. Um, can you see Norman's green shank and redneck stint? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'm not prepared to promise a Nordman's green shank. There's one on the Esplanade in Cairns at the moment, but um, yeah, that's the the very first time it's turned up there, and I missed what the second species was. <laughs> but I, I I think it was probably another frivolous question. Yeah, I think we take that as no. And and redneck. <laughs> Is all over the place or tough? To oh, get? redneck stint. Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. If you if you come uh, between um, uh, late August and early April, uh, I can show you redneck stint. But they won't be in breeding plumage. So they, as they're coming into breeding plumage, they they can look quite handsome. Uh, as they're coming out of it, they tend to look a bit scruffy. We got about three minutes left here, and we've been bombarded with questions. Oh, question askers, where did you come from? Uh, where did I come from? Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, where did the question come from? Yeah, we're getting flooded here, and that's just fine. I'm going to sort of try to manage through them. Um, what about whale sharks? That's a surprise. I get that question all the time. Uh, whale sharks are spotted off the Great Barrier Reef occasionally. It's not a place that you'd go if you were particularly after whale sharks. Uh, go to Western Australia, Ningaloo, uh, Christmas Island, or uh, friends go out to Samoa uh, quite frequently. They're a bit crazy. They they can't get enough whale sharks. Right. Um, not sure how to ask this next question given our time left, but we'll try it. Um, I just want to thank everybody who's participated. We've left, we lost quite a few participants, but we'll, we're going to take this one last question and then sign off. Um, in the United States, there's very distinctive migration period periods, April, May, June for spring, and the fall, September, October-ish. Do you guys have like migratory periods like that? Uh, in North Queensland, migration apart from shorebirds is not a significant uh, factor. We do have a few species that move through, uh, like um, uh, Rufus fantails, um, one of the monarchs, the satin monarch, and um, but, and there's some altitudinal migration that are local. Southern Australia has more, but even there, it's nothing like the migrations that you get where birds can move from one hemisphere to the next. Great. Um, I think we're going to sign off. Hey, Alan, I just want to say thank you for your time this morning. And most people, afternoon or evening, thank you for your time. And we hope to get you all on some Australia birding tours in late 21 and 2022. Please call us. Um, and I think our late 21 tours, one trip has a couple spots left and the other trip has three spots left. So we'd love to get you on board. Um, I got nothing more. Anything to add, Alan? No, just uh, stay safe so that you can come and visit Australia. Right. Thank, thank you, my friend. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Alan. Bye. Bye. Cheerio. Everybody, bye.